you have cancer, three words that change a life forever. We would like to offer another three words. Be an overcomer. Welcome to the 1% Podcast, where our conversations with other cancer warriors, survivors, and caregivers allows us to give you that extra boost you need to face your challenge head on, live life from a new perspective, and forge a path that keeps you moving free and clear. Now, welcome your host and cancer survivor, Truett Taylor. Welcome to today's episode of the 1% Podcast, the show where we interview young adults who are battling or surviving an unexpected cancer diagnosis. You are not alone. And I promise by consuming today's content, your soul will be fed with the hope, courage, and inspiration you need to keep fighting for today. I'm excited to be on your journey with you today. If you haven't done so already, be sure to head over to 1percentpodcast.com to sign up for our email list to see the latest news and updates for all our guests on the show. You can also check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at 1% Podcast. If you want to join in on some of our discussions, please join our Facebook group, The 1% Podcast. To contact me directly for content, questions, or booking events, you can email me at info at 1percentpodcast.com. What is going on, everyone? This is episode 28 of the show. We have a killer interview today and a very valuable piece of information to get started with. So let's dive right into today's 1% moment of truth. So at the end of each interview, I ask each guest to give us one or two pieces of advice. And out of all the shows I've done so far, there tends to be one piece of advice that most guests give. So today's 1% moment of truth is on being a self-advocate. So how can you be your own advocate when you have cancer? If you've been online or read anything recently about cancer, you've probably heard the lingo, phrases such as self-advocacy or being an empowered patient. So all this alludes to shared decision-making between a patient and a physician. Typically in older generations, when people went to the doctor, they basically did everything the physician said. But now today with more of a modern approach to medicine, patients have more of a voice when it comes down to making decisions with their physicians. So obviously medicine is changing. The new phrase, participatory medicine, refers to a new relationship patients have with their physicians where they're working actively with their physicians to choose the best course of treatment. So a lot of people wonder, how can I make these decisions without going to medical school? Or how do I become an advocate for myself? So I'm going to give you a few quick tips today to help you become a better advocate for yourself. So tip number one is learn about your cancer. Ask questions. Ask a lot of questions. Asking questions is extremely important when talking to your oncologist. While these physicians are accustomed to explain the ins and outs of cancer to patients, everyone enters a diagnosis of cancer with different experiences, so don't be afraid to repeat questions until you're satisfied that you understand the answers. Bring a friend with you and don't be afraid you're taking up too much of your doctor's time. Oncologists recognize the importance of addressing questions. It can save you time and headaches and phone calls later on. Tip number two is get a second opinion. It's important to note that one doctor cannot know everything about your type of cancer. Combined with this, advances in treatments in some cancer centers is skyrocketing. Another factor sometimes overlooked is the personality of your doctor. When it comes to cancer, you may be working with your physician for an extended period of time. It really pays to find a doctor who meshes with your personality and leaves you feeling comfortable and confident. What some people fail to realize is that even if your second opinion physician recommends the same treatment plan as the first, you will have the reassurance that you haven't left any stone unturned. And peace of mind can be priceless. And finally, tip number three is connecting with a cancer community. When I was going through treatment, I had no idea what I was missing out by not connecting with the cancer community. Being a part of a support group, online cancer community, or a podcast like this is going to be completely valuable for you and your treatment. The great thing about being a part of communities like these is you're going to hear information that you probably never thought of. The communication it will be an excellent starting point for you if you aren't sure what questions you even should be asking. So a quick recap today's 1% moment of truth is number one, ask questions. Number two, consider second opinions. And number three is join an online community or support group and don't face this alone. All right, so my guest on the show today is Mr. Thomas Cantley, a.k.a. Mr. Ballsy. Thomas is a speaker, filmmaker, and globally recognized testicular cancer advocate, who Men's Health Magazine calls one of the most outspoken voices in the fight against testicular cancer. He has traveled 8,000 miles across two countries with his dog and a giant six-foot testicle named Lefty in order to educate, inspire, and create awareness. Mr. Balsey has been featured on The Doctors, 
MTV, CNN, The Today Show, Huff Post Live, and several other media outlets, and can be found on Facebook or Instagram at Mr. Ballsy. As if Thomas hasn't done enough already, Thomas just released his first comic book. You can check it out at Ballsy Comics. So enjoy my interview today with Thomas Cantley, a.k.a. Mr. Ballsy. Thomas, what's going on, man? How you doing today? I am well, and yourself? I'm doing great. Looking forward to talking to you all week. I uh, was telling you earlier that I was watching some of your videos before our uh, conversation today, man. I'm really excited to share your story. I know it's been publicized all around the world and stuff, but I'm really excited to get your story in our listeners' ears today. So excited to have you on the show. Why don't you start off with telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so uh, basically where it all, uh, I'll do the short form. <laughs> Uh, you know, I was, uh, I'm originally actually Canadian and, uh, like any artist and filmmaker, I ended up deciding to, uh, move to New York city, the big apple, um, you know, in my early twenties. And, uh, I was actually a photographer, a fashion photographer and in my bustling career and, and, you know, stresses of the industry and hustle and bustle, um, I ended up kind of like getting into the wrong crowds. And, uh, you know, it, it turned out to be that I ended up putting myself into a position where I was, I was, I was in places where I was very accessible to drugs and I started doing uh, a lot of cocaine and other drugs and started kind of spiraling, um, which actually led me to living on the streets. And, uh, you may not know this, but I, yeah, I was and a lot of people may not know this about me. Um, I was actually born. Uh, I lived on the streets when I literally got diagnosed by cancer. Wow. So that's, uh, you know, it was pretty the lowest of low in my life. And I just was kind of coasting through and I was just partying and I was drinking and I was doing all this and just, you know, around celebrities. And, and uh, I wasn't really taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. um, I was not really really thinking about the actions and you know the aftermath of it you know i was just going oh you know i'm in my 20s having fun you know drinking getting laid all that shit and then, yeah you know um all i remember is i woke up one day and a woman found me in a bush have you ever seen the movie basketball diaries yeah <laughs> it was like that it was like literally containing me saying hey she was a friend of a friend she's like you need to get your shit together um, she actually ran a cancer organization. It was called Cancer 101. And uh, just was trying to get me. knew I had like great potential. Um, and she actually, I started volunteering for her and helping her out with her organization. She said, hey, uh, I'm going to start. I'll pay you. You know, like, let's, let's just get your life on, on track. And three weeks later, I got diagnosed with testicular cancer. Damn, man. How old were you when that happened? Uh, I was 29 or sorry, 26. So you're 26. You're kind of starting to come out of that spiral a little bit from the drugs and things like that. Cause you meet somebody who kind of shows you a new way in life and starts taking care of you. When you got that diagnosis, what, what was your first initial thought? Well, I was, uh, you know, I was feeling really good because I was getting a lot of compliments and, you know, and, and how people really enjoyed talking to me when I was helping her out. And just seeing that someone really cared about me was amazing. And then all of a sudden I'm like, you know, I got cancer and it just happened really fast because I actually had some abnormalities of early on signs that I was kind of ignoring. And it was for at least about eight months where I had like a dull ache. My testicle was the size of like, you know, the consistency was really hard. So it wasn't soft. It just had some major abnormalities. I didn't have any lumps or anything, but it was something I was ignoring. And, you know, it, it actually put me in the ER. And, you know, that's what got me there. It wasn't, um, all of a sudden I had this horrible, 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 excruciating pain in my abdominal area. And I literally, I didn't know what to do. So she ended up taking me to the, the ER on uh, the upper west side or upper uh, east side. And uh, they diagnosed me in the ER. So at that point, I was still in so much pain. It didn't really hit me right away. Um, you know, at first they were like, okay, you may have a torsion, which is a twisted testicle. Um, it could be testicular cancer, but we're not really sure. So, you know, even in 2009, um, you know, it was still, testicular cancer was being diagnosed, but not as, not as much as it is today. So that wasn't the first thing that they were, you know, thinking about when I was in the ER. They're going, right. oh, it's going to be torsion or you have, this you know and it's just the last thing was even testicular cancer 
anyways they ended up doing an ultrasound on me and i was kind of like still high from the you know the narcotics and stuff like that they had me on not because you know i was clean <laughs> but um uh, you know and they did the ultrasound and they're like hey we see some really um we see some really uh you know we see some little uh situations here that could be you know testicular cancer and we're going to need to do a ct but this is a very high chance that um you have testicular cancer and it could have it could have spread was there a part of you thinking hey man i'm getting my life together now then all of a sudden i get this diagnosis out of nowhere yeah i was i i you know i mean i it didn't come to me thinking that i was gonna die or anything i was just kind of going like why at the same time i was kind of like of course of course i'm getting this you know it's just i feel like i was always getting handed these these just obstacles that i had to overcome you know i was like oh great another another thing like you know and i just kind of cancer never really sunk into me right away i was just kind of like Fuck, like really you know now this really yeah <laughs> um and and yeah so i just it just never really absolutely like kind of sunk in at that moment i was I just rolled with the punches in there because I was going, all right, so what does this mean? Because I didn't even really know what it meant. You know, you're 26, you hear about cancer, you think old people have it. So what does this mean? I know I'm not dying. What does it mean as a 26-year-old getting cancer? Yeah. So you got the diagnosis. Did you immediately go to surgery or what was the line of treatment for you? So they did the orchiectomy, uh, you know, immediately um, because the testicle was, you know, they thought it was a torsion, but as soon as they found out that it was cancer, they wanted to remove it right away. They did a CT scan a couple hours later, but they, um, when they removed the testicle, uh, they found out that it was cancerous and that after the CT scan that they did, they said it actually spread to my abdominal layer um, and that I'd have to potentially go through chemo or radiation and then have a RPLND. Um, which is a lymphatic site, uh, lymphatic dissection. Um, but that was going to be a surgery at a later date. So they said, you know, once you recover from the orchiectomy, we don't want it to spread too much. So we're going to schedule for um, another couple of months. All right, man. So you got all this stuff going on. You start having the surgery. Uh, they remove, they remove your testicle. You said, do they remove lymph nodes too? Or how, do, what's that whole surgery like? So um, I actually have the surgery online. Um, Cause so when they did the orchiectomy, they just removed the ball and I had a small like scar in my lower abdomen, which, you know, most people think like when they remove a testicle, they're like, you know, they go, how do they do that? You know, but it's like, if you pop a balloon, you know, you know, you're not doing the surgery down there. It's going to be in your lower abdomen where all your nerve endings are and stuff like that. And then they're going to kind of pull it out. But, um, that happened really fast because that was just in ER. It was an emergency, um, surgery. But the lymphatic dissection, um, they said to me, well, you know, they brought me in after they had the orchiectomy and everything. They said, hey, Thomas, you have stage three testicular cancer. Um, You know, we're going to have to operate um, pretty immediately, but we need you to recover. And, you know, as soon as they started talking about a major surgery, you know, um, an incision from the top of my breastbone down to my lower abdomen. Here I am in the arc and I'm thinking just money, money, money. This is just going to. I can't afford this. So because yeah. I'm Canadian. Canadian originally, I was like, I said, Hey, is there an opportunity for me to go back to Canada um, to have this surgery? And they said, yeah. So I ended up going back to Canada to have my surgery. And then, you know, in, in that time I was able to kind of go, Hey, I'm going to put myself as a test subject and film everything. Um, so that's that's when I was able to why well, I have you know getting to the point of what we're talking about right now is that um, I have that surgery footage online so it's on my YouTube channel yeah man I was checking some of that stuff out it's crazy so question for you and this is something that is a recurring theme with a lot of the listeners that I have is being able to tell your story like kind of like what you're doing right now and you know and I encourage everyone listening to be able to communicate and share your story because it's part of the healing process and I know we're going to get to that as far as what you were able to accomplish by you know, the big event that you had twice, actually. But um, did you know prior to you starting to film your, your process of the surgery and all the way through the end that it was going to help you kind of cope with everything that had went along ahead of time and you know, just the process of having cancer and all that? Did you know that ahead of time that that was going to really help you process everything? 
No, I mean, honestly, I was pretty, I was just bluntly selfish. You know, I was going, I'm a good looking dude. I'm going to put myself on camera <laughs> and use myself as a test subject. Yeah. And maybe it'll get picked up or something. You know, I mean, that was my bluntly honest truth that it's taken me years to kind of be open about saying that is just kind of going, Hey, this was my big break. I looked at it as, you know, yeah. and in doing so, like when I really kind of hit me when I was on the streets, when I was the first time when I was in Toronto um, and I did my first push in Canada, this little girl came up to me and she asked if she could sign the ball for a friend of hers. And I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. You know? And she was the one who kind of like hit me with, you know, with the whole concept of my ball push across the countries of why it was important. And she kind of, I didn't even think about having anyone sign the ball. You know, that wasn't even anything. She came up to me and was like, Hey, do you have a Sharpie or something? Can I draw on this? And I was like, yeah. She, and then that's when she was like, you know, what's this for? She started asking all these questions. She was literally like seven or eight years old and she was just so smart. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, I'm pushing the ball for Tistic Other Cancer across the country. And she goes, well, can I, can I sign it for my friend? And I was like, you know, who's your friend? She's like, my friend is actually in the hospital right now going through, you know, leukemia and is only nine years old. And it's just, you know, I was like bawling my eyes out. She's like, can I write a special little message for her? And I go, of course, you know, here I am just seeing this little, this little girl, just so, so amazing and, and, and just inspiring and strong to like want to, write this story on this ball and just be so intellectual it was just amazing. And, you know, she hugged me and she laughed and it was just one of those moments where I was like, you know, this story and this signature and this, on this ball means so much more than, than what I'm doing. Like there is a bigger picture. I don't know what the hell it is yet. Yeah. At point. But I was like, I'm going to get everyone that I meet to share their stories on this ball. And it's going to be this transporting Buddha ball with all these amazing people um, who've been affected by cancer, who have, you know, in any, any form um, and just really have it as a, as, as a therapy ball. Um, and she really just kind of, this little girl just ignited this um, amazing kind of raw, experience you know and and she kind of that was the first kind of real realization that what i was doing was not just a media being a media whore and trying to put myself on tv or something you know it was like there is a defining purpose of why i'm doing this i just didn't know why yeah definitely a bigger picture i think it kind of brought that into perspective for you why don't you tell everyone listening today you know what you actually did. So you decided to inflate this large plastic ball and just push it across Canada and then push it across the U S why don't you tell everybody a little bit of the backstory about what made you decide to do that? And, and some of the stories all along the way. Yeah. So, you know, so when I was in that transition period, when I was going through, you know, when I had the orchiectomy, the testicle removal, and then I had that two weeks ish, for my next surgery that was going to be in Canada, I had a little bit of downtime and, you know, I was kind of going, Hey, I'm just going to film everything. I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do here. Um, and I just decided to document everything and film everything. And that's when it kind of, kind of started. Um, and, and just kind of that I wanted to kind of shoot a documentary and, I put together a little trailer of me going to, you know, the sperm bank and talking to my surgeons and just running around and doing all this stuff and diary cams. And I put together a little teaser trailer. I had a couple of friends of mine help me film it. And um, I started pitching some uh, networks and production companies in New York. So after my post-surgery, after my surgery and everything, and I was recovering, I went back to New York. And I started just like knocking on people's doors. And there was this guy, Matt Ginsburg, who is the creator of the show Inked um, and LA Inked. And, um, you know, he's very nice to me because I just kept hounding him and hounding him. And, you know, he opened up the door and talked to me. And I think he regretted it ever since because I just picked him so many ideas afterwards. But no, he's, he's great. He loved me. But, you know, him and I were kind of chatting and just kind of going like, well, he goes, Thomas, he goes, you know what, let's be honest. Like, you're just a regular guy you know, and if you're doing a, you know, you need something 
crazy and out there to gain impact to get the attention because other than that if you don't do something that is you know out of this world that's going to get that attention you're not going to be able to get that attention to your cause you know you need something to attract media to then allow you to deliver your message and i was like okay that's great yeah because he goes at the end of the day cancer is depressing you know and a lot of media won't touch it because they're just like you know it just has to be timing wise right so and strategic so or you have to have your spin. So he goes, anyways, a couple weeks later, him and I figured out, I'm just going, hey, what if we get a giant inflatable testicle, six feet in diameter, just, you know, an obscene size ball, and you just push it across America. And I said, you know, and, and you know, Canada or America, you know, because I didn't, you know, I didn't do either at the time until then, you know, yet. And then um, he said, come back to me when you, you know, when you, when you flush this out. So, that was in 2010, almost 2000, because I was thinking it was 2009, 2010. I decided to do this. And, you know, I, I, I tried to pitch so many people to get this ball across the country. And I was just, it took years, you know, I ended up trying to do this, you know, trying to get this documentary out, trying to get this ball across the country. And I'm like, this costs money, a ball production company, getting a van. I, I drafted up so many different ideas and plans and stuff like that. And that was in 2010-ish going into 11. I didn't push the ball across Canada until 2014. So this project actually sat for quite a while because I'm like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do that. Like All these roadblocks. And that's what we have in life. Yeah. And then I realized, you know, I was working at a, a job in Toronto at the time. And because um, I was always back and forth to Canada, US, whoever would hire me. <laughs> And always was like kind of trying to build my brand with Ballsy. And this person, uh, you know, was, I was, I was actually kind of just trying to figure out whatever, whatever I could do. I was just really trying to like keep the Ballsy, Ballsy train going. And long story short, I was actually in the development of writing a book, went to this book publisher and she was very interested in me. She represented Leonard Cohen, a bunch of other famous Canadian people. And she saw an article that was posted about me in 2011 saying guy was going to push a ball across Canada and America. And she goes, what happened to this? And I go, cause this is like 2013, 2014. And I go, Oh, you know, I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't get the funds, couldn't make it happen. I'm going to do it eventually. And she goes, mom, I can't represent, I can't represent people who don't finish things. And right then and there, that moment, I was like, thank you. And she goes, what? And I go, thank you. You were exactly what I waited for because you didn't believe in me. And you're telling me that I couldn't finish something. You woke me the fuck up and now I'm just going to go do it. I'm going to find a ball. I'm going to figure it out. And I'm just going to get a one way trip ticket and I'm going to go across the country. Thank you. And she said, I'm either going to regret this or I'm not. And I go, well, you're definitely not going to regret it. So two weeks later, I quit my job. I got a hold of a company uh, in LA um, and I got the ball sponsored. I got some donations to cover the ball. I did an Indiegogo campaign. Um, the same people who created the show Wipeout or well, not created the show Wipeout, but they do all the blow up stuff for them. Uh, they're called, the company's called Sportigo. I ended up talking to this woman, got the ball shipped down, quit my job. And then I just said, since I have no money, I'm just going to try and go across the country all in kind and start from one end and go to the other and yeah. get there. That's the way. Cause I have no money. I'm going to figure yeah. it out. And so that's how the, the concept kind of came about. And Canada was kind of my trial run and I did it. And um, cause I wanted to prepare for the U S cause I really wanted to kind of be ready to go across America. Cause that was like my, for media and, you know, cause I was still in that phase of like marketing and producing where I was like, okay, I need to, Canada is not going to get me the exposure that I need, you know? So I need to do it across the United States in order for it to be really relevant. So, so that's kind of the journey that I did. I went all the way across Canada, met some amazing people, met that little girl in Toronto who really woke me up and kind of took me out of the media spin of just kind of really focusing on this, you know, idea that I had and that it was something way more. Um, and then he, literally a year later, I did the U.S. push. Did you find yourself all on the way doing it for other people instead of just for yourself? Yeah, I 100% did. Cause in the beginning it was for me. Um, I, and then it was all about like 
meeting these people, hearing their stories, having them write on the ball, like, you know, and that was the most, I saw that transition in how I was talking, um, you know, and what I was engaged in. It wasn't about me. I didn't want it to be about me. Yeah, I was the guy pushing the ball. Um, but I just really wanted to be about them. I wanted to be their voice. I was their traveler for them, you know, to be their support. I was on the ground. I was, I was there connecting with them and going like, hey, I'm in the trenches for you. And I didn't realize that at first, but then I realized that's what kept me going, you know, when it was, we couldn't, we didn't, we couldn't eat or couldn't find a place to stay. Um, I just knew that I was doing it for these other people, not myself. I think once we do things for ourselves, once that needs met, which if it's met in, immediately or soon, we kind of run out of energy, but if we're doing it for other people, you know, along the way, there's so many people that you'll meet that at that moment you're meeting their need and then you meet another person and you meet their need and you've come to find out there's more needs to be met out there than just yours. So if you're living your life, I think a lot less selflessly, honestly, I think you'll enjoy life a lot more because there's so many people that need that little piece of you that may be motivating or strong. And I think it's awesome that you were able to provide that all across the country in such a cool way. Did you have one story in particular or maybe one or two that you met a certain person that really kind of changed your perspective or really put things back into perspective? Because as you're traveling, as you're running roadblocks, I'm sure they come across moments where you're like, man, this is, this is tough. We don't have anywhere to stay. We don't have anything to eat. I don't say the thoughts of quitting came along, but it probably got pretty challenging. And then somebody or something would come along to really kind of push you through that moment. Yeah, there was, I mean, there's definitely, I mean, there's so many moments because there were so many amazing people and, and, you know, it's, uh, at the end of the day, yes, it's, um, you know, we, we, we do everything for ourselves, you know, and no matter what, you know, it just, what I always look at it, it always kind of balances your percentage. So you're going, instead of being a hundred percent for you, <laughs> you know, it turns into a more balancing percentage of what you're doing for other people, why you're doing it for other people, but also you need to balance it for yourself too. You know, and, you know, just to, to riff off that, but like, I would say like my, my most memorable moment where I think it kind of humanized me was when we were kind of in the end of our, our, our drag. Um, man, I got so many, you know, but um, we were coming at the end of our drag and we, I ended up having a lot of people help me out. Like a lot of volunteers were helping me out. I had a whole social media team. Um, you know, a couple friends of mine that were just really amazing, reaching out to people in the next cities to kind of, you know, not only get a hold of media, but also get a hold of survivors and doctors and stuff like that. And um, two things that were really, no, okay, I'll say two. I'll, I'll make them really short. But um, one of my partners uh, to this day is Dr. Philip Piriazio. Um, I had one of my social media people reach out to him. And I was like, hey, I need, to, I need to get a doctor interview. And he was based in Baltimore. And he's actually the head of um, the testicular cancer department at John Hopkins Hospital. And, you know, and you may know his name also from my comic page because he's actually one of our comic characters. Um, so he is someone who is just, uh, I met him. He took my whole team to dinner. Um, he's a young doctor. He's innovative. Um, and he has a whole program that he creates. I'm actually going to be seeing him next week um, at the Testicular Cancer uh, Summit that I'm going to be speaking at because he's on the board. Um, we had a lot of small mutual friends, but it was amazing to meet someone so young and so dedicated to the cancer community. Um, you know, he's only like 38, 39, and he's a surgeon, you know, and he has, these, he has this organization called Beers, Balls, and Bros., he gets survivors out. They have beers. They connect. Um, he's one of my biggest supporters. Um, he's allowed me to create him as a comic character in my book. Um, and anything I want or do, we have a great program that him and I work together on where he just, if he has some survivors that are having some tough times, um, he passes them my way um, just because he knows that, you know, through the preliminary stages of cancer pre and post, um, I give a great, you know, voice and um you know, helpful ear, um, you know, based on experience. So that was one of my, my favorite moments. And then my second, my second favorite moment was when we had to detour about three hours and I had my team saying, Thomas, we, we can't go 
three hours because we only have a certain amount of money to um, to cover ourselves because we were donated all this money all the way. And then um, we had to fill up the gas tank and stuff like that. And there was this young guy who was just dying to, dying to meet me. And he was actually in the hospital going through chemo. And I said, we have to see him. We have to go. You know, we can't just not go see this kid you know the brother but it's like three hours you know we're so close to new york we're almost done the finish line i'm like i don't care we just we gotta go so um we ended up going the the extra three hours just to go see him go off road and visit him surprise him in the hospital and got to meet him i got photos of him and i his name's sven um he actually just had a baby uh, around the same time that i did with my son and um we stayed in touch online but just being able to see his smile on his face seeing that i off-rooted and took time even though it was only for about half an hour i was with him because that's all he could do be you know based off the energy that he had for him to see that how much i cared would meant the world to him you know and he told me that afterwards and stuff like that and you know we've you know sustained our relationship and those are the moments you know that just you know, touch my heart, um, in a non corny way, you know, but it's just, it's like, that's real, you know, I'm making a difference and I'm making an impact in their life that will be there forever. What kind of advice would you have to give to someone right now that maybe going through something similar that you went through or another type of cancer that just, that just feels like completely given up? The biggest thing is I was actually talking to my wife about this the other day. Um, you can never give up, you know, we, you know, even, even though we mentally sometimes want to give up, our bodies are always constantly fighting, you know, it's, it's just instincts, it's human nature, it's, you know, it's our body, if we get a cut or anything like that, it scabs because it's the protective, you know, it's, it's just how, how life works. Um, and we just have to realize that we have the strength to fight through it. I mean, sometimes we unfortunately don't, but you have to just, you know, one of the strongest things that is under undermined is the mind, you know, and, and we don't really feel that we don't have that much power over it, but our mind is so powerful. It is conquers our thoughts and, you know, takes over a lot. That's where depression is. That's where your mental states are and stuff like that. And you get these ideas, you Google, I tell everyone the biggest thing, one of my biggest things that I, I even told Jackie Shea was I was like, you know, she's like, what is the worst? That, like, what is one thing that you would tell people not to do? Don't Google anything. All right. <laughs> you could have a cut and it leads to cancer. Anything, yeah. <laughs> you know, anything leads to cancer. And that's the biggest thing is would be Google. Like don't Google things, but just really control your mindset and just really realize that life is beautiful we have been given the opportunity to have a life. Cancer is cancer. At the end of the day, we're all going to get it at some one way or another, just how we deal with it, you know, and mentally it's just, you see it, it's just over the past years, it's progressively gained so much and you just have to think, okay, what's going to happen to my body is going to happen to my body. Like what is going to happen in life you can, you can go off course and path it however way you want and detour and go down that little alley. But guess what? You come right back and you still have cancer, you know, and stress and all these unnecessary things. Is that's another thing is just telling people like, do not stress. Like my wife will, you know, stress all the time over nothing, over nothing. And I go, where did that get you? Because here, here's, you know, the result is right here. It's the same exact way. You, you know, when you feel stress, you can actually feel it and it hurts your body. So just imagine like physically what you're feeling is what it's happening internally. And, you know, and one thing that I always say that I like to, I forget where I heard this, um, this education, but someone told me once that the only foreign objects that get um, access to your internal objects are what you put in your mouth. So we have no protection on the inside. So this is me kind of jumping ship a little bit, but it's also the things of like just educating people of what to think about as well is what you are, what you eat, like literally. So what you're putting into your body, because it has that exposure into your internal organs, that is so important. You know, everything from mental, you know, when 
you know, cause we're, you know, half the time, like, you know, someone's getting, uh, you know, they're popping pills and, you know, or they're eating certain foods and because it's just out of convenience or something like that. All these, my wife and I were, were, um, uh, I'm vegan on most days. Um, but I, I do have my, <laughs> my, uh, my guilty pleasures. Um, but, uh, we try not to eat things that don't have anything we can't pronounce, you know? So when that is going into your body and things are processed, they have citric acid, they have all these other things in it. That exposure is getting access to your internal organs. So these are a couple things that I'm, I'm, I'm putting together of just saying that what is so important for people out there is to take care of your mind and your body. So what's going into your mind and what's going into your body are like two marrying things that are super, super important and that we have full control. So what you're putting in your mouth, you have full control. What you're putting into your mind, those thoughts, that embodiment, that, that feeling of like anger, that hate, everything, if you just, you can switch that. And that's the crazy thing about it is like you control those two things and, and it's just like Tony Robbins says, you have a choice, you know, in anything. You, you make that decision, whether it's food, whether it's your thought, you either feel that, say that, or do it, you know? And you just have to really get into that factor of um, shifting, your, shifting your mindset. Yeah, man. It's all about intentionality. You know, you have to make up your mind that you're going to do that, whether it's food or the thoughts that you put through your mind. So as this all came to an end, I know you've been on several shows and you've been on, you know, featured in a lot of different articles, you know, your life after all the things that you've done. I know you have a comic book that you're doing right now. Why don't you tell people what your life is like now that you're on the other side of your cancer diagnosis and, you know, after you've got all this, you know, fame and stuff from pushing this ball across the U S and Canada, what's your life like now? Uh, my life shifted quite a bit. Cause then, you know, I, you know, after I pushed the balls, I just was kind of like, Hey, what do I do next? And it's funny, like everything adds up and works out the way it's supposed to, you know, I pushed these two balls and my whole goal of these balls since I started, it was in 2010 was a new documentary. It's 2000, almost 19. Yeah. Documentary hasn't seen the light of day. And if you ask me, do I care? No. You know what? Because one day it will, one day it'll come out. But for me, it was more important was these experiences that I had. And, and old Thomas me would have been like, so focused on pushing this documentary, getting it out, doing it like that. As soon as it's done, I have all this amazing footage. And I do my friend who shot it flew in from Malaysia. Him and I went to film school together and he shot, he shoots for amazing race. And I mean, the, the footage is incredible. I have a trailer, you know, it's great. I'm just like, kind of like, eh, you know, it's just a puzzle and the piece because now I look at where it led me to today is now it's kind of, you know, I have a kid, I have a wife and I'm like, these are the things that matter in life. And I'm going now cancer has finally actually hit me in my thirties where I've, I was going through this, you know, kind of my own way of dealing with cancer up until recently of going, wow, you know, it's, 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 it's my mindset has completely shifted and I'm not selfish anymore because now I'm going, I'm, I can't even watch a cancer movie. I can't, I can't even watch Deadpool because I start like hyperventilating and freaking out because it's, but it's over my son because I'm going, I brought this little boy in this, into the world and I have this wife and now I'm like, I can't die now. You know, yeah. I can't, I can't have this happen. So, you know, and then, you know, so I'm a completely different person in that aspect. And I go, everything is led up to now is which, which is my comic book. You know, I, I could selfishly want to write a book about myself, but I don't want it. Cause I'm like, it's not about me, you know? Um, so I did a comic about myself, <laughs> but still selfishly, but it's, the context isn't fully about me. I'm a character in it. You know, I have so many of these other people who, what we're doing is I got a publisher on board. I got an artist that's, that was amazing enough to kind of um, draw the artwork for free um, up front. Um, and then a publisher came on board. That's going to help us distribute. I'm literally getting my comics this week. 
which is really exciting. And all our cancer heroes are based on um, real cancer survivors. So that's something kind of cool that we're incorporating. We have educational information in there, but it's, it's an uplifting story. So what I really wanted to do is I wanted to, you know, all these other organizations are doing all these amazing things. I didn't want to write a book about myself and I just wanted to have be, create something that would be a tool for um, cancer survivors, non-cancer survivors to kind of go, Hey, here's some education, whether, you know, we can appeal to both audiences. So going, if you don't have cancer, but at least maybe it'll make you think about it and listen to your body and be proactive. But then also the people in the hospitals seeing these superheroes fighting these cancer villains, it's also going, wow, they look like me. You know, that's me. Now I don't just have a Marvel comic hero to look up to. I have, you know, someone who has, you know, it's focused on, on that, on their world. I love that, man. One question I ask a lot of people is what's the best thing that came out of your cancer story? And you kind of hit that a little bit with that, with your answer just a second ago. But, you know, if you can think of more specifically, like now that you're on the other end of stuff, like, you know, what's the best thing that's happened to you since you've gotten cancer? Uh, see, I look at, and I, I say this line all the time is I go, cancer saved my life, you know, and people go, Whoa, that's fucked up. But um, it did because I was a drug addict. I was on the streets. I was spiraling down. I wasn't caring about myself. Um, I really was just the most selfish, um, dirt bag. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I couldn't get any lower. Um, and then I got cancer and it just completely altered my life and my perspective. And, and that's what I try to tell people too, is look at your perspective look at cancer as a different perspective um may not be my situation but just be you know be blessed you know and for me i just was in my experiences i go i love what i do you know i've never been paid a cent for what i do with ballsy i invest my life with it um because the best thing that i can ever get is i have my life i have my family and I'm a resource for survivors. You know, I have guys from all over the world and women who, who reach out to me. And, you know, I have guys talk to me about um, all their current situations that they're having post-recovery, whether it's impotency, impotency issues, um, going into surgery, um, anything. And they know that I'll answer. And I will at any time, my wife, I'll be in the middle of the night, you know, rolling over at two, three in the morning and I'll have like a little day on Facebook. And it's like one of my guys from Mexico or someone in Sweden, you know, and that's the cool thing about social media is I'm always, I'm a lifeline for them because, you know, when they tell me that I've helped them or I've given them comfort, that's why I do this is because, you know, you know, if I can help just one person, um, feel more comfortable or make a, a shift or a mindset change um, that benefits their life, then I've done my job. Yeah, man, everything you're saying to me kind of brings me to one point. And it's something my wife and I talk about a lot is not wanting something that's not yours. And, you know, when you first started this whole journey, even back to, you know, where you were struggling with like the drugs and stuff like that, like, you were wanting everything to be yours in a way. And then when you started the documentary and we were, you know, the ball push, like you wanted the, the fame and you wanted the attention. But as you got along your journey, you knew that all that attention wasn't yours. It was supposed to be on the people that you were meeting all along the way. And through that journey, you, you know, obviously you had physical and financial and emotional struggles going across the country, which is kind of like the story of life in a way we all hit those roadblocks. But um, it's all about the long game, I think, in the way. And all the people you met along the way, you know, that signed the ball, all those things like that, you never know, like, what impact that has on their life. Because they'll always have that memory of, there was this guy pushing this big ball around, I went and signed it and wrote a story. So, you know, you've got thousands of people all across the U.S. who ended up getting all the fame and attention and everything else and what they needed just because – you decided not to take what wasn't yours, which I think is, you know, as men, we're by nature, we're probably a little more selfish because I think that's just the way biologically we're made. So, but you, you denied all that stuff and you really highlighted 
the people that you met and even go into the point now where you, you'll answer phone calls and texts and all those things to people all over the world. Like you're making a huge dramatic influence in so many people's life. Um, you're not a selfish guy. You, you're putting this comic out for everybody as well too. So honestly, man, just talking to you, it makes me super proud to see another guy who flipped the script on everything and has turned his story into something that's continuing to help people. And we're young, man, you know, we have got so much life left to live and who knows how this little piece of the puzzle is going to dramatically change something five, 10, 15 years from now, whenever you meet all these different people. And, you know, when you think you get all these, this attention from what you did already, imagine in the future, the dramatic impact it's going to have there as well too. So honestly, man, it's an honor talking to you about everything. And I really appreciate you sharing your story and stuff. So tell our listeners where they can connect with you. I know you're extremely accessible, but I know you've got a somewhat of a website out right now. We were talking about earlier, but tell it like a blog, email, social media, where can our listeners connect with you at? <laughs> well, first off, tell everyone, do not go to, and you can put this, mrbalzi.com because it is not me. I have some, you know, whatever person uh, impersonating me on that website. But uh, I do have um, all my social media is right now. What I'm promoting is the big balls of comics. So you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, my Twitter's weak right now, but um, uh, it's all Mr. Ballsy, but I, my website is in development right now. Um, and it's, it's going to be you uh, are Awesome. So on Facebook, Instagram, it's at Mr. Ballsy. And Twitter, you said Twitter, you got to get your Twitter game up, man. But, um, Mr. Ballsy, all Mr. Ballsy. Pretty awesome. easy. And or, yeah, oh, sorry. sorry, sorry. Big Ballsy Comics. Yeah. Big Ballsy Comics and, and Mr. Ballsy. Yeah. Perfect. So just c- connect with Thomas through social media is the best way to get in touch with him. Thomas, man, it's, it's a pleasure chatting with you. I'm sure we'll have many more conversations as things go along. I'm really thankful that we've been putting each other's life just just this beginning for us as far as things go and stuff in the future, man. So I really want to appreciate you being a guest on the show and thank you to all the impact, you know, for all the impact that you're going to have and all the people listening, man. It's, it's a pleasure to chat with you today. Thank you for having me. We appreciate you spending time with us on today's episode and encourage you to continue the conversation to help you keep pushing forward. For more resources based on today's episode, as well as ways to recommend a guest and connect to Truett personally, head over to 1percentpodcast.com. Be sure to join us next time for more stories of inspiration right here with Truett Taylor on the 1% Podcast.